Good afternoon, New York, and the rest of our listeners around the globe. My name is June Stoyer, and I'm the host of the Organic View Radio Show. Our podcast is available on iTunes, Zoom, and you can also visit our website at www.theorganicview.com. If you'd like to be on the show or would like to find out about sponsorship opportunities, please contact us at questions at theorganicview.com. Today's show is sponsored by coronatools.com, the nation's leader in garden and landscaping tools. Listeners of The Organic View can receive 20% off their coronatools.com purchase by using the coupon code ORGVIEW. That's O-R-G-V-I-E-W. For more promotional offers, please visit our website at www.theorganicview.com. And don't forget to check out our contest section. On today's show, my guest is my favorite expert on beekeeping, Mr. Tom Theobald. He is going to share his advice for new hobbyist beekeepers and what they can expect the first year, especially if there is a high risk of exposure to neonicotinoids. So I'd like to welcome to the show, Colorado beekeeper, Mr. Tom Theobald. Hello, Tom. Hello, June, from somewhat sunny Colorado. We're in a little bit of an unsettled period, but uh, the bees are here from California, and uh, I'm checking the queens, and I'm back into beekeeping. Thank you, Tom. A lot of people listen to this program and have been doing so since its inception back in 2011. Hard to believe how much time has flown by. However, there's still a lot of people who are learning about the program as well as your advocacy. Can you please share with our listeners about your own journey to becoming a commercial beekeeper and also some of your other experiences as a beekeeping expert? I'm not sure I want to commit myself to the expert part, but uh, I do my best. I've This is my 42nd year of beekeeping. I started after 10 years in the corporate world, and I did not like being inside and uh, I stumbled into beekeeping, and beekeeping turned out to be a very good match for my interests in life. Outdoors, independent, working with a natural system. And uh, I had, uh, oh, 20 or 25 really good years when, in effect, I, from the standpoint of beekeeping, I farmed the county. I had uh, as many as 12 different bee yards. At my peak, I had 200 colonies of bees. About 10 years into the beekeeping, I started doing what is called double queening, where I established a second queen in the colony and produced a very high-performance, highly productive colony and uh, referred to myself as a community beekeeper. I operated within about 15 miles of home and, and supplied primarily a local market, and it was a substantial part of our family income. I also was uh, the last of the county bee inspectors at that time. That position was created in about 1891, and I was the last, and it was retired in the year 2000. I uh, was one of the founders of the Boulder County Beekeepers Association. At one time, I was the vice president of the State Beekeepers Association, and uh, I was involved in, in most of what beekeeping requires Pesticides have always been a concern, and more recently, an even greater concern, and we'll talk about that a little bit, because beginning beekeepers uh, are confronting those problems as well. Thank you, Tom. Each year, you actually teach a class for new beekeepers. Can you share with our listeners, what are the goals of this class? We started this class I think 18 years ago, and I thought at the time we would teach it for two or three years and then we would have satisfied the demand, the interest, but as it's turned out and with the influx of new beekeepers, we have continued continuously for 18 years and and now we have two classes a year and it's eight weeks and what we try to do is we try to give beginning beekeepers the basis, the basic understanding that they need to be a beekeeper, to take care of a colony of bees. And uh, we've turned out several hundred new beekeepers. Now, not all of them are still beekeepers today, but 
We've kept the beekeeping community alive here in Boulder County, not just us, but we've contributed to that, and that's that's the purpose of the beekeeping class. What are some of the significant changes that have taken place since you first began teaching hobbyists until now? We began uh, the beekeeping class when we really hadn't begun to confront the problems that the parasitic mites, the varroa mites, presented. And the pesticide challenges were challenges that we had dealt with for, well, ever since the Second World War. And what's happened more recently is the introduction of the family of pesticides called neonicotinoids. Nicotine compounds that have been amped up in the laboratory and are among the most toxic pesticides that have ever been used. That's that's a major change, and uh, it's something that the new beekeepers are subjected to. All of the beekeepers are subjected to it, and it's had a devastating effect on American beekeeping. Neonicotinoid pesticides have become the most widely used insecticides in the world. This isn't simply our view. It is indeed a fact. Be that as it may, how can new beekeepers prepare for exposure if this is indeed even possible? Also, what should they be aware of as far as choosing a location for their bees? That's a good question, and uh, you've kind of answered it yourself. I don't know how the new beekeepers or the older beekeepers are going to be able to avoid this family of pesticides. And these are not the only pesticides that we're exposed to. There are many others, but I think a major player in the losses that we've seen has been the neonicotinoid family. And even the people who are knowledgeable have failed to grasp the enormity of this environmental poisoning. I'll just run through the figures very quickly one more time. The EPA reports that 4 million pounds of neonicotinoids were used in America. I think the most recent figures are for 2013 or 2014. And they compare that to to DDT, which at its year of highest usage was 80 million pounds. Now that, that looks pretty good. But what you don't see until you dig a little deeper is that 90% of the use of the neonicotinoids is not regulated nor accounted for because it's used as a seed treatment on many of the major commodity crops. And the EPA conveniently has excluded it as a pesticide use under a section called the treated articles exemption. So the the fiction is that the seed coating is there only to protect the seed, but it's not, and the chemical companies market their product on the basis that it will deter insects that chew or suck on the plant far beyond the seedling stage. And if we look at the figures, the EPA reports 4 million pounds Add that 90% that goes unaccounted for to that. Multiply by the fact that the neonicotinoids are five to 10,000 times more toxic than DDT. And what you get is the astounding result that what we're doing every year is we're putting into the environment the toxic equivalent of somewhere between 400 billion and 600 billion pounds of DDT. It's in the water, it's in the soil, it's everywhere that we've looked. So, can hobbyist beekeepers avoid this? I don't know how. It's used extensively, the neonicotinoids are used extensively in agriculture and in urban and suburban environments. I don't know how we avoid these chemicals. I just want to take a moment to address the fact that in addition to honeybees, there are other populations of pollinators that are drastically reduced because of neonicotinoid exposure. Tom, I know you wanted to address the subject of the natural predators. So could you talk about 
some of the issues that hobbyists should be concerned about as it pertains to some of these natural predators, such as the wasps, yellow jackets, so on and so forth? The yellow jackets uh, don't really become a problem until late in the season. And the yellow jackets, along with many of the solitary bees, the non-social bees, overwinter as new queens that are mated in the fall. The parent colony dies out, the queens survive the winter, and then they begin the whole process over again in the spring. And that's where we are right now. The queens are out. Many people are putting out wasp traps, and this is the time of the year to do that because each queen that's captured represents a potential colony of wasps. But not all those queens are going to be captured, and some of those queens are going to establish colonies. And although it's a hard sell to most people, the wasps are a beneficial insect. They get their protein source from other insects, whereas the bees get their protein source from pollen. That protein goes to feed the larval stage, both for the bees and for the wasps. So the wasps are out there as a check on the abundance of the insect world, and they're harvesting insects that we probably like even less than them. For the gardeners among our listeners, take the time a little later in the season to observe in the garden, and what you'll see is you'll see wasps cruising through the carrot tops and the plants, and every so often a wasp will land, nail an insect, and fly off. That insect is breakfast for the larva. But what it's doing is it's keeping your garden free of many of the pests that you would like to control and which some people control with heavy chemicals. So the wasps are beneficial. But over the course of the season, the wasp community, the population of the wasp community will increase. And in the fall, when the wasp population is at its peak, the wasps will begin to challenge the bees. And if a colony is strong, they have guard bees at the entrance. They deter those wasps. The wasps go on to another colony and, and test their defenses. If they find a colony that can't defend itself, then the word gets out just as this, as honeybees would develop a bee line to a flowering crop, the wasps develop a wasp line to a colony that can't defend itself, and they can kill out a colony in the fall. For beginning beekeepers and experienced beekeepers, this is something they need to watch for in the fall, and at the first indication that the wasps are overcoming the guard bees, the entrance to the colony should be severely restricted down to an inch or two so that that colony has an entrance that it can defend. Once the robbing gets undertaken full-blown, it's very difficult to stop, if not impossible, and it's terminal for the, for the colony of bees. This is mother's, Mother Nature's way of redistributing the resources in the fall, uh, Seems a little cruel and brutal, but that's how things operate out there in the jungle. Thanks, Tom. And I just wanted to take a moment to just read this uh, little bit of information that was provided by the United States Department of Agriculture's Forest Service. Basically, in regards to wasps, they write that they are very important pollinators, and they look like bees but are not generally covered with fuzzy hairs and as a result are much less efficient in pollinating flowers because pollen is less likely to stick to their bodies and to be moved from flower to flower. And they also mention that there is a particular type of wasp that is called a fig wasp, which are responsible for pollinating almost 1,000 species of figs. And so that's something I know that is a very important subject for many of my friends who do have fig trees, including myself. Uh, but I just wanted to mention that wasps, as well as the yellow jackets and other insects in that family, they are important species. It's just they're not talked about as much as honeybees, especially since they are such a huge commodity when it comes to pollination services for many of the foods that we enjoy. 
I guess I would uh, take a different position from the Department of Agriculture. I think that the the majority of the wasp population is carnivorous, and any pollination that they accomplish is incidental to their other activities. There are times of the year when the adult wasps will take a little nectar. As you say, they have slick bodies, not fuzzy bodies, so they're not good conveyors of pollen to begin with. There are exceptions, uh, and you talk about the fig wasp, and that would be one of them. But basically, most of the wasps that we see, what we commonly call yellow jackets, are carnivorous and predatory. And that's, and that's their beneficial role in the environment. I'm not their biggest fan. I made a grave mistake several years back trying to fill a hole that was in my yard all the way in the back, and I tried to fill it with um, some natural cat litter. I don't know what I was thinking, and there was a yellow jacket's nest in there. And, of course, I was out there with flip-flops on, shorts, and a tank top, and the yellow jackets flew up, and I guess they must have called their family and friends because they came after me, and I was stung five times. And let me tell you, that was pretty painful and hurt for several days thereafter. But uh, I know many people that have had similar stories. Well... The wasp doesn't have a barbed stinger. For a honeybee, a sting is a life-ending decision. A wasp, on the other hand, can just tattoo you, can sting you multiple times, and and doesn't take much tampering, will react more quickly than a honeybee would because they have less invested in that defense. And uh, they're a little more difficult to deal with, but... Even with the wasps, if they're away from their nest and they're out foraging, they really are pretty well behaved. Tom, I always see a lot of comments from newbies claiming that they're not having any problems with their bees, and they can't understand why the commercial beekeepers are experiencing such high losses. Can you please explain to our listeners, from a commercial beekeeper's perspective, what are the contributing factors that make these losses happen? Well, we've talked about some of them, and I think uh, one of the major players is the neonicotinoid family and uh, and other pesticides. Um, I hear about these hobbyists who are so successful. I don't know where they are. Uh, I look at the hobbyist population here in our county, and their losses have been on the order of this past winter of 80%. So... I don't know where these successful hobbyist beekeepers are. I think, in part, they they have different standards. When I was producing a honey crop in support of the business and the family, I double queened, and an average beekeeper, average colony, single queen colony here in this county would produce about 75 pounds of honey, surplus honey, each year. With a two-queen colony, I expected over 200 pounds per colony. And uh, for the hobbyists, uh, they don't have that reference point. They think if they get a gallon or two of honey from a colony, that's been a bumper crop. Well, it hasn't been a bumper crop, and they may not be doing nearly as well as they think they are. And my personal experience is their losses are as high or higher than the commercial beekeepers. Thanks, Tom. Well, we have reached the end of our segment today. I want to say thank you so much for all of your time and for addressing these very issues. I know we receive a number of emails and messages about these very topics that we talked about today. So, Tom, thank you so much for joining me today. I would uh, just like to say welcome to the hummingbirds. We got our first hummingbird yesterday. I've been watching them through the tracking system on the Internet, watching them move up from the south. And the front of the hummingbirds has just passed through our area. None in Wyoming yet, but that will be next. And I'm sure people in other parts of the country are watching them just as I have. I put the feeder out about a week ago, and I've been watching every day. And finally yesterday... The first of the hummingbirds showed up, and I enjoy watching them all through the summer. So that's a, a, a very pleasant springtime event. 
I'd like to thank you, June, for having this program and for all of our listeners who keep tuning in and commenting and we encourage their comments and we try to answer their questions. What we're saying is important and and I and I'm happy to have the listeners tuning in. Well, thank you so much, folks, for tuning in. Tune in next week as Tom and I continue the discussion. This has been June Stoyer with the Organic View Radio Show. Have a great afternoon.